Well, welcome to the online portion of this course. Now, um, some of you may have seen the first video where I welcomed you to the online portion of the course. However, due to uh, technological failures, or exogenous technological shocks as we can call them in economics, hooray, woo, we've learned things. Um, it didn't really work out very well. And so I had toyed around with the idea, do I want to finish chapter 10 or like sort of try to redo chapter 10? Or do I just kind of want to chalk it up to a loss and jump right into chapter 11, which is the real business cycle model, where ultimately all of the important material from chapter 10 will show itself in this model and then the following model. Now the idea is going to be to get this model done within about a week, two at the most, and then we will talk a little bit about monetary policy and then cut into the new Keynesian model. We'll wrap the course up with some of the theoretical predictions of the new Keynesian model as well as some applications of that model. So without further ado, let's get started. Now the real business cycle model came from what is now referred to as the Lucas critique, namely as we saw with the solo growth model and we briefly touched when I started trying to compare it to the neoclassical growth model, we saw there was no individual choice. There's no household optimization in the solo growth model. There were a lot of business cycle models that were operating in a very similar fashion. It's not exactly something that's particularly good if we want to try to accurately predict what's going to be happening in the real world when it comes to business cycle analysis. So, a couple of guys got together to try to figure out the way that they could fix this Lucas critique, which basically said that we could look at what a certain policy did historically. So we could analyze, you know, well, if we're looking at the Great Depression, what did the New Deal do? We can talk about some things like that. We could talk about how certain monetary policy interventions might have worked historically. However, there was really very little room for the role that household optimization plays. And if you're not including that, you're omitting a certain variable out. You're omitting a very important variable from this, which is the household choice. And so by leaving it out, you introduce what's known as endogeneity. Now, under endogeneity, basically what that means is you don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. So by allowing for individual optimization in this particular model, they helped sort of address some of the endogeneity issues, got around it, and ended up giving a model that provides relatively accurate predictions, at least when it comes to supply-side or technological shocks. It doesn't do very well for demand-side shocks, which is where the new Keynesian model came into play about 10 years or so later. So, let's talk about some assumptions of this model. And we can begin to go from there. Now, if you saw me use my inhaler, it's because I have asthma, not coronavirus, don't worry. And the two are unrelated. At least as of yet. Okay. Now, this model is what's referred to as a dynamic stochastic. Mm -hmm. general equilibrium model, and it was the first of its kind. Now it's dynamic because what we choose to do today That's the future, right? We've seen this with the law of motion of capital accumulation in the solo growth model or the investment flow equation. We've seen this already. That's a dynamic element. 
right? So by making a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, at least the first word of these four words in this alphabet soup that comes out to be SGE, at least that one wasn't anything particularly new. Now it's stochastic. because there is uncertainty in the model. And what that implies is that there are going to be shocks in the model that are subject to the laws of probability. So there's going to be a random element. Now when I say random, I don't mean arbitrary. Random and arbitrary, when it comes to economics and time series econometrics, are two very different things. Random would mean that it is subject to the laws of probability. Therefore, if we were to take draws from a certain distribution, right, that distribution would be a random variable. We take a draw from it. That draw is going to be subject to the shape of the distribution, the moments of the distribution, so the mean, the variance, the skewness, kurtosis, etc. Right? All of that is what's going to make it stochastic. Now, in this case, there's uncertainty, which means that every single period, there's going to be some probability that a shock will occur. Now, if that shock occurs, the economy is going to respond to it via a number of different mechanisms, which we'll be discussing soon. And by general equilibrium, what we mean here is that all markets are included and they all clear. Like I said, this was the first of its kind. This was a really, really, really big deal. Now, ultimately, we have a general equilibrium that gets solved out, and it's done in a, in a dynamic framework. So if you remember the solo growth model, when we had all that stuff with the steady states, it's the exact same thing here. And there's going to be a stochastic element to it where households, firms, governments, monetary authorities, etc., are all going to be responding to these different types of shocks via different policy choices. Now, what the real business cycle model says is that the economic fluctuations or the business cycles we experience are the result of real shocks. So what are real shocks? Well, real shocks are like shocks of total factor productivity, shocks to the production in the economy, right? Another real shock would be a labor supply shock is like what we're seeing now, which is driving all the stuff with COVID-19. Right, that's, that is a real economic shock that we are experiencing. Give me a minute here. I'll try to adjust this in a way that I can sort of bounce around and you can still see me, I hope. So, the real business cycle model just says that all the shocks that are experienced in this model are the result of real shocks, hence nominal shocks don't have any real effects. So what is a nominal shock? Well, a money supply shock would be a nominal shock. A government spending shock would be a nominal shock. 
really any demand side shocks that we'll be looking at in this model are going to be nominal shocks. Therefore, anything that is driving a demand side shock or demand side push through any of this is not going to have any real effects. And we'll get to why that is the case in just a moment. So let's talk about what some of the assumptions of this model are. As the assumptions of the model are really what's going to drive home why this economy only responds to real shocks and not nominal ones. This is section 11.2. Assumptions. Now, the real business cycle model borrowed from the classical school of economics, which basically suggests that first, business cycles are driven by real factors, and in addition to that, the market is generally best at allocating resources. Now, as we have seen, just in the real world, sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not. It's generally true. Markets are generally much more efficient at allocating resources than any sort of essential planner. And so this model borrowed from that. So what are some of these assumptions? Well, some of the assumptions that we'll see are driven or I guess inspired by the classical school of thought, but not all of them. So it's not like all the assumptions I'm putting up here align only with the real business cycle model. It also lines up with other types of DSGE models. Now the first one, which is really one of the most important ones, is we finally have households. And what these households are going to do is maximize their utility. And they derive utility over consumption and leisure. We'll get into why it is leisure, well, right now, actually. Excuse me. So, oh my god, he just gave us a really scary looking equation. Not really. So just the utility function goes over time from where t is equal to zero, or today, up to infinity, meaning that this household is assumed to exist forever. Now is that a realistic assumption? Probably not. However, there, like I said in class, there's a little bit of mathematical expedience that comes to this that allows us to derive good meaningful predictions, at least for a short to medium run analysis, even if we assume that this model exists forever, which we know the world is eventually gonna end, the universe is eventually gonna end. But, yeah, it'll last at least long enough that we don't have to worry about it anytime soon. All right, so we've got this beta to the T, which is equal to 1 over 1 plus rho to the power of t. Now rho just has to be positive. It's got to be greater than or equal to 0.
So rho measures how impatient we are. So if rho were to increase, what that means is that we save less, meaning we want less future consumption, and instead we want more current consumption. So we save less, we consume more. Now as we saw from the solo growth model, if we decide to consume more, that means investment drops. If investment drops, we're saving less, so there is less future output to be consumed. Now in the solo growth model, this row term wasn't there. So there was nothing to really choose why the economy was saving the way it was or wasn't. But by including this row, we're removing that endogeneity by adding in individual household choice or individual household optimization. So if this row gets bigger, then that means we value today's consumption more than tomorrow's consumption. Why is that? Well, beta between zero and one. All right, so let's say let's just let beta be one half for a second. All right. And we're gonna let what we want to know What's going to happen is we go further into the future, meaning T increases. All right, well, T equals zero to infinity. I'm just going to ignore this for a second, look just at what beta is doing. So I need the sum as T goes from zero all the way up to infinity. Well, there's a T here. So all I'm going to do is just plug in whatever T is going to be into this. So in the first period, T is zero second period, beta is the same, beta is constant, right? the only thing that's time varying about beta is the power it's raised to, so in the first period it's just zero, second period is one, third period, square it, fourth period, and cube it. So what's that going to give us? Well, anything to the power of zero is just one. Right? What's one half to the power of one? Well, that's just one half. What's one half squared? Well, it's just one half times one half. So you multiply across the numerator, multiply across the denominator, you get one fourth. Look at what's going on here. Supposed to be one half. Oops, ignore that. Fix that in post. What's one half cubed? Well, if one half squared is one fourth, we just multiply that by one half again. We get one eighth. So as we see, as we get further and further into the future, this beta term is getting smaller and smaller. So beta is a weight. compares future to current consumption. Another way to think of it is the percent that we care about future consumption to current consumption. All right, so if beta is one half, that means that tomorrow is only 50% as important to us as today is. If beta was 0.9, then tomorrow is 90% as important to us as today is. So the larger beta gets, the more we care about the future.
Now, if beta increases, what that means is that rho is getting smaller. We're getting more patient. Now, why is it the case that they're going to be moving in opposite directions? Well, we look, rho is in the denominator. So as anything in the denominator gets bigger, right, the whole fraction is going to get smaller. But as the denominator gets smaller, the whole fraction is going to get bigger because fractions. So that explains this time discounting that we're seeing. Right, but we've got one other component that we want to look at because we've seen consumption already. We know what consumption is. So what is that little L term? Well, that L term is actually kind of important to us. LT is leisure. Right, it's sitting on your ass. It's doing nothing. Now, households like to consume and they like to sit on their ass. They like to do nothing. So they derive utility from consuming, meaning the more they consume, the happier they get. But they also derive utility from sitting around and doing nothing. So the more they sit around and do nothing, the happier they get which I hope for all of you is uh, something you prefer because it looks like we're going to be doing a lot of that for the next month now. So if this LT is leisure, right, well, what is, if we're sitting on our ass, what are we not doing? We're not working because we're sitting on our ass, right? So I think that we're not working. Now there's this theta term which tells us basically how much we enjoy not working relative to consumption. Well, why is that? Why would that theta term even be there? Well, what's the only way that we can consume? Because there's really only one way that we can consume, at least in this model, and that's by working. So if we want to work more, we get to consume more. I'll say if we want more consumption, We have to work more hours. And just by default, the more we work, The less leisure time you have. Now, if we work, we work, then working generates labor income via wage earnings. These wage earnings are income. We 
we get more income because we're working more hours, then we get to consume more, right? We get richer, we get nicer stuff. We all like having nice stuff. So we're gonna go, well, you know, sitting around and doing nothing is fun from time to time, but I need a house at least to be able to sit around and do nothing in. So I gotta work at least enough to get a house. Now, I'm gonna have a house, I'm probably gonna wanna have a little bit of furniture in there. So you're gonna have to work enough to you know, be able to afford some furniture in your house. Unless you're totally cool just having a beanbag chair and an old tube TV in your house. And in which case, hey, cool, that's awesome. That would be reflected through data. But you're gonna to wanna to have at least some kind of furniture. You're gonna to need to eat. You got a family, you're gonna to need to take care of your family. So, there's a trade-off here that's generated. The trade-off between consumption and leisure. And we need to work in order to be able to consume, but work sucks. So because work sucks, we don't like working any more than we have to. Therefore, we enjoy doing nothing but we only want to do as much nothing as to be able to afford the consumption that we also want. So to have more of one, we have to have less of the other. So if I want more leisure time, that's great. I'm gonna to have to give up consumption in order to make that happen. If I wanna consume more, I'm gonna to have to give up some leisure time, meaning I gotta work more. All right, so you're probably going, all right, Jeremy, that's awesome, but why are we looking at leisure in this utility function instead of labor? And that would be a very good question to ask. I wouldn't blame you for asking that question. In fact, I asked the exact same question when I learned about this model. And here is the reason. The reason already on the board. And what is that reason? Well, work sucks. So we include leisure rather than labor in the utility function because the utility function measures how much we like things, not how much we don't like things. Now we're going to use leisure here, not labor, because like I said, Leisure increases utility and labor decreases utility. So if leisure is this curse of L, labor is just going to be this capital L. And it's measured in hours worked in this case, not the number of workers. So remember, this utility is for one worker, one household. So if there's labor in here, it's gotta be measured in hours, not number of workers. Now there's a nice little trick here that allows us to look at leisure in a way that will let us back out what labor is. Oh, 
let's say each period lasts for one unit of time. It can be a day, week, month, a year, whatever you want. If you're George Lucas and you don't really understand astrophysics very well, it's a parsec. But whatever it is, each period is going to last for one unit of time. All right, let's let it be a day. We're looking at everything by day. Well, there are 24 hours in a day. means you got 24 hours each day to allocate between labor and leisure. So there's a certain amount of labor that I'm going to consume or a certain amount of labor that I'm going to allocate in my day towards the day. There's a certain amount of leisure that I'm going to allocate. And, well, it's got to be equal to 24 because you can't sit on your ass and work a number of hours that's going to exceed 24 if you're only looking in one day. So if we just treat this as a day instead of 24 hours, right, you could say that we're normalizing this to one day. What we get would just be this. Now, yeah, I just did a little bit of weird voodoo math here. Don't worry about it. It really should have been like XLT plus Y, capital LT. But whatever. Just think about it in terms of this. There's a fraction of the day I can sit on, sit on my ass and do nothing. There's a fraction of the day I can work, and those two fractions have to sum up to one. So, if I want leisure in my utility function, I'll just solve that guy for... Leisure. Well, I just get one minus labor, or capital LT. So what that says is that leisure, right, is the amount of the day that I'm spent or that I spend not working. So I could theoretically just substitute this one minus capital L in here. In which case, now it is in terms of labor, but this theta is still reflecting how much I care or how much I value leisure to consumption. But by including labor in there, I can look at how the household is going to choose its working behavior or its labor allocation throughout the day. Right, now this is just how the individual household operates, but there are other players in this game. How do we know those other players? Well, you have to work for somebody. I mean, you can work for yourself, that's great, but if you're going to work for yourself, then you're going to have to have somebody who wants your labor. There's going to have to be some kind of demand for your labor. Right, you're not going to demand your own labor. It's Well, you could, but you're not going to make any money doing it. So if we've got households that are maximizing their utility, and part of that utility deals with how they choose to work,
Well, they have to work for a firm. Firms maximize profit. What does that mean? Well, it means you maximize profit. The firms produce output Y, which is a function of labor and capital, which is this right here. And they've got a cost function. Price is labor, L, at a real wage, lowercase wt, and capital, which is K, at a real interest rate, RT, lowercase RT. So they maximize profit, and they face these costs. wages for each hour worked, and an interest rate for each amount of, or each unit of capital that's used in this production. Now, if firms demand more labor, excellent, they're going to have to pay more for it. The only reason they demand more labor is if there's some need for output to go up. All right, so what this model is sort of doing is it's tying supply and demand into the same, two different sides of the same coin. Now, in addition, firms don't own the capital. Households own the capital, and they lend the capital out to the firm to generate non-labor income. So we can see, really, the firm is owned by the household, in a sense, because the household is lending capital and labor out to the firm in order to produce, right? Which kind of makes sense if you think about it. Because, let's say, you work for a company and you also own stock in that company. All right, well, the company is basically owned by its shareholders. The shareholders... Obviously, they have a home they go to, at least at some point. So if these shareholders have a home they go to, they're, well, households, and they're still providing labor to the firm. So the firm ultimately is owned by the household. So firms and households operate interdependently with one another. Can't really have one without the other. Now, some of these types of models stray away from this assumption. This model does not. That's that all firms and households are identical. So every single firm, every single household is the same. Now, there are a lot of firms and a lot of households. So 
such that no one really has any kind of market power over anybody else. So there's no monopoly power in here. All the markets, thus, are perfectly competitive. Now, there's another thing here. The model exhibits something that's known as monetary neutrality. And under monetary neutrality, a one-time increase money supply has no real effects. That means is if a model exhibits monetary neutrality, if we increase the money supply through just one like a one-time shock, then it exerts no real effects, which means prices and nominal interest rates, namely just nominal variables, will be adjusting such that output won't have to. So if the monetary authority in this model wants to try to increase the money supply in hopes of increasing output or increasing production, well, they're going to be pretty upset with themselves when they realize that monetary neutrality holds and they can't do that. Now, the model also has another property that is of vital importance. That property and is what's referred to as Ricardian equivalence. Assumption number seven. Is that Ricardian equivalence holds? Under Ricardian equivalence, the householder HH. Household internalizes the budget's government constraint such that the timing of these government purchases won't be affecting the consumption savings choices that the household makes. So, in other words, if the government goes, well, you know, we've got this coronavirus thing going on, and uh, well, we're really worried about the American people. We want to make sure that people can still, you know, afford to make 
their rent payments, that they can still afford food, they can take care of their families, etc. So we're going to mail out a couple of checks over the course of like the next month or whatever to these households. So we're just going to give them some money in order to let them be able to continue to make their payments, allow them to continue to keep the house they live under. Well, that's cool, but under a card and equivalence, basically households go, uh, 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 now I see what you're doing. You're spending money on us. That's nice. We like that. We like you spending money on us. But we also understand that the only way that you can get any sort of resources to spend in the economy are either through taxing or borrowing. So if you're sending us this money and our tax rates aren't going up, that means you're borrowing it. But you can't borrow indefinitely. You can't just pay off the money you owe. You can't pay off the debt you owe by taking on new debt. Eventually, that'll start to spiral out of control. So the only other way that you can pay this back is by taxing us. So if you give us money now, but tax us in the future, then it's like you never gave us money. So we're not going to spend more money. Therefore, if your goal was to try to stimulate the economy by giving out a bunch of borrowed money to households, and all households are identical, then they know they're just going to have to pay it back tomorrow, so they're going to hold on to it. So their income isn't going to change, their spending behavior isn't going to change. You literally just put money in their hands, they go drop into an account, do nothing with it until it's time to pay back their taxes later, and then they just take that money and just pay it back to the government. Now, that also kind of works in the reverse. If the government decides, okay, well, we want to raise taxes now because the economy's doing well in hopes that when the economy tanks, we can take all that tax revenue and then dump it back into the economy to try to stimulate the economy when we're in a recession, well, the household's going to go, uh-uh, uh-uh, I know what you're doing. Again, you're taxing us more, but we're going to get that money later. So again, their consumption savings decisions aren't affected. Hence, we're carving equivalents. Basically, if you were to look at the math of this budget constraint, the government's expenditures, their borrowing and taxation, gets canceled out by the household's expectations of government spending and their borrowing and taxation. So, if this whole thing cancels itself out, then on the margin, consumption savings decisions aren't affected. So, basically, what that establishes is that the monetary authority can't really do very much and the fiscal authority can't really do very much. So basically the central bank and the federal government are just the two kids that are sitting in different corners of the classroom eating glue. Now when we get to that whole thing about monetary neutrality where that one-time increase in the money supply isn't going to change any real economic variables, right? Well, a real economic variable would be production. If production doesn't get changed by a money supply shock, what that implies is that prices are perfectly flexible. So if you're a firm, you're running, I don't know, a, hmm, you're running a hamburger stand, right? Now, let's say the government drops a bunch of money into people's hands. Well, not the government, the Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. or, you know, the European Central Bank, whatever your monetary authority of choice is. They're going to just do like a helicopter drop of money to these people, and they all come to your hamburger stand. They're like, we want to buy more hamburgers. Well, if prices are perfectly flexible, what that means is that you can just go, okay, cool. I just noticed there are a bunch of people that are coming in to get these burgers. If they want more burgers, they're going to want me to produce more. But I'm already maximizing my profit, which means I'm already choosing exactly how much I am going to want to produce 
And if I already know exactly how much I'm going to produce that maximizes my profit, making any more is straying away from profit maximization, which isn't a particularly good thing to have here. Because, you know, we always want to maximize profit. Everybody's optimizing. We're all choosing the optimal values that make things as good for us as they can possibly be. Well, you know that making more burgers is going to be inefficient for you. So what you do is you raise your price. As soon as you notice that increase in demand for these burgers, or you notice this demand shock for burgers, boom, the price instantly changes in order to guarantee that your production doesn't change. Right, which means a perfectly inelastic supply or a vertical supply curve. And so if you've got a vertical supply curve, in this case, a vertical aggregate supply curve, I'm going to have downward sloping aggregate demand curve. And you've got your production. And if there is an increase in demand, price is going to increase. but there's no change to output. Prices are perfectly flexible. Now, assumption number nine. Because of the name of the model, the real business cycle model, well, the economy either enters or exits recessions because of real shocks. Nominal shocks have no place here. What we're seeing here, this shock to aggregate demand, that's a nominal shock, and it has no impact on a real economic variable, but it allows nominal variables to move in a way that they perfectly clear the market so that the real variables don't have to move. So these real shocks would be like total factor productivity shocks, labor supply shocks, things of that nature. Nominal shocks, money supply shocks, government spending shocks, preference shocks over consumption, so that little beta term changes. If that changes, really anything that's going to be driving the demand side of the economy is not going to be having any real economic effects. Now, Assumption 10. We went over the welfare theorems of economics. Before, and in this model, both of them hold. So if both of these welfare theorems hold, we discussed what they were before. The first welfare theorem is that a competitive equilibrium yields a Pareto efficient allocation. The second welfare theorem is that a Pareto efficient allocation yields a competitive equilibrium. We need both of them to hold in order to have both a Pareto efficient allocation and a competitive equilibrium. Then what that implies is that every single equilibrium we get is efficient.
even if we're in a recession. So there's no way we can make anything better even if the economy is in a recession. Which leads to assumption 11. We've got governments and monetary authorities. Because of assumption 10, we don't need any stabilization policy. So it doesn't work. Nor is it needed. So if we enter a recession, and the government decides to try to spend more money to boost demand in order to try to boost output, well, we've got a perfectly efficient equilibrium, perfectly flexible prices, Ricardian equivalence, monetary neutrality, anything they try to do isn't going to work because everything is as good as it can possibly get, which is one of the shortcomings of the model, which we'll be discussing in a little bit. <clears throat> now, because of all of these assumptions, government spending crowds out private investment. So what does that mean, government spending crowds out private investment? Well, if you look at this, output doesn't change. So regardless of what kind of shock we have, output isn't going to move. So if output doesn't move, right, because remember, output is GDP, This is output, right? Government spending goes up. Well, government can spend either through taxation or borrowing. So let's assume for a minute government spending goes up because they borrow more money. Borrowing goes up and interest rates are going to increase. Now, if interest rates increase as a result of increased borrowing on the part of government, right? remember investment deals with the flow of capital. Capital is priced at an interest rate R.
Well, we've only got finite resources that can be used in the economy. So if the government wants to borrow more, well, there's less, there are fewer loanable funds. If loanable funds decrease, right, the way that they get rationed is through a price. That price is the interest rate. Therefore, if interest rates increase because there are less loanable funds, firms aren't going to want to invest. Why are they not going to want to invest? Well, the reason they don't want to invest anymore is because why would you invest when interest rates go up? You're going to want to wait till they drop. Right? Why would you... If you're thinking about buying a house, why would you buy a house when, an, when the interest rate is ridiculously high? Because, well, there's no reason you'd want to buy a house if interest rates are ridiculously high. You'd want to wait. You would just wait until the interest rate drops until it's low enough that makes you happy. That you're like, okay, well, yeah, now, now I'll buy the house. Right? The same thing goes for the firm's investment. Right, firms want lower costs. Right, their the costs they face are the prices of their inputs. Well, investment's an input because well, investment's a function of capital, and capital's the input. So the price of capital going up means that they're going to want less capital. They want less capital, they invest less. Therefore, the government borrowing more money is going to reduce investment. So if this guy goes up, let's write it out in a slightly different way. Let's think about this government spending and this GDP stuff in terms of percent changes. Right, so we got the percent change in output equals a percent change in consumption plus the percent change in investment plus the percent change in government spending. Now let's say the percent change in output is zero. Right? Well, then what I do is I just rewrite this as zero equals a percent change and consumption. Is equal to the percent change in consumption plus percent change in investment plus percent change in government spending. We have an increase in government spending, the percent change over time in government spending will increase. And if that happens, that means that the sum of consumption and investment, or the sum of the percent changes of consumption and investment, have to drop by the same amount that government spending increased by. All right, well, one of the things that I was going to mention in the previous chapter, but decided just to blow over to get to this stuff instead, and then just sort of deal with these topics as they show up. Investment is much more volatile than consumption is. At least in terms of interest rates. Let's just go ahead and pretend for a second the percent change in consumption is going to be zero. 
All right, then what we have is just zero equals a percent change in investment. This percent change in government spending. Well, that means for every single percentage point that government spending goes up, investment is going to have to drop by that equal amount. So if the government borrows more money, interest rates are going to go up. And because interest rates are increasing, that's going to disincentivize investment, which means that there will be a slowdown in the growth of future output. Wait a minute, no, 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 hold on. Jeremy, I thought you said this thing was zero. Yeah, it is. Why is that? Well, because, okay, government spending, you'd think would slow down the growth and output, but wait a second, no. The nominal interest rates will increase. However, real interest rates will remain unchanged, therefore production will remain unchanged. If production remains unchanged, then investment just has to decrease by the amount the government increases. Boom. That's the crowding out effect. Basically, because we've got finite resources, if government spends some of these resources, then there are less of those resources for the private sector to be able to use. So if those resources are all spent up by the government, no one else can use them. Firms can't use them. Firms can't invest. If firms can't invest, well, then we get what we get. So that's going to wrap up this particular video. And next we will talk about what the equilibrium is like within this model. So until then.